Oh man, I am stuffed. Definitely good for the night. <sighs> Just grab some uh, some water. Yeah, I'll grab some water here. Did I leave the oven on? Better go check. Better safe than sorry. You know what they say. <laughs> no, nope, oven is good. I mean, since I'm here. Maybe a quick bite will just help me go to bed. <sighs> oh. Oh, what's up, guys? What are you doing in my fridge? Oh, what, what, what was I doing? Um, just checking that the oatmeal cookies were proper temperature. All right, maybe we just won't talk about this. I'll, I'll see you tomorrow. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, welcome back to another week of How to Health. We're spinning off a new playlist. You'll start to see more and more videos added to it. It's called How to Eat. My name is Kevin. I run liftandbalance.com where we take aim at all things health and do it in a odd, weird, interesting, highly sarcastic manner. Last week we covered how processed foods can F you up over time. Leading you down the slippery path of chronic metabolic disease and dysfunction as you age. Worth a watch. This week, we're gonna discuss some new research. Some very elegant research, may I add. And it highlights how a high sugar, high fat diet can disrupt your body's natural rhythms, otherwise known as circadian rhythms. These are your daily sleep-wake biological cycles. And the question that it embarked to answer was how a high sugar, high fat diet that is available 24 hours, seven days a week, kind of like the one that modern day humans have, changes the organism's behavior from the inside out. And I wanna be clear before we start, this research was done on an animal model using our favorite four leg cheese loving friends. Not cats, not cats, mice, that one. Yeah, this study very elegantly aims to mimic the current food landscape that us humans have at our disposal day in and day out. And I think they do a pretty good job using mice and all. So you know at a high level now what the authors were after answering, what model they were working in. Let's talk about the methods. So they took a group of mice and they fed them a standard chow, one made up of proper nutritional composition. This group was used as the control for the study. Then they took a second group of mice, same kind of mice, and fed them a high sugar, high fat chow. Now researchers allowed both of these groups of mice, the regular diet, the high sugar, high fat diet, have 24 seven access to their food source. So what did they find? They found that mice eating the standard chow diet did normal mice things, eating at night sleeping during the day, and staying rather healthy throughout the duration of the study. Now, as you might be wondering, the high sugar, high fat chow mice did something a little different. They ate, and ate, and ate. They ate a lot. They ate during normal feeding hours, which is, like I said, at night, but they also continued to eat and forage for food when a typical mice is sleeping. Instead, they were up at all hours of the night, or morning, depending on whose time you're on, mouse time or human time. But they were foraging the whole time, looking for food, eating food. They literally became addicted to the high sugar, high fat food game. Uh-oh, and guess what happened? They started to become morbidly obese. Hmm. So let's talk about what is happening here. Researchers found that the high sugar, high fat diet 
what's acting on the mice's hedonic pathway or the reward pathway in their brains. It's just a side note, we have this pathway as well. And each high sugar, high fat meal was accompanied by a dangerous flood of their feel good neurotransmitter dopamine. Their brains were rewarding them immensely for finding this food and eating this food, this high sugar, high fat food. And that right there reinforces the behavior. And maybe here is just a good moment to take a step out of the research for a second and talk a little bit about why this may be happening. We talked about this in a lot of other videos, some recent videos as well, but essentially this all sinks back up to evolution. As we evolved, food was just not readily available as it is today. Not until the last 200 years or so has food been, you know, this widely available and really in the last hundred years. So when food was abundant, we needed to store that food so we can use it later when food wasn't around. So we've evolved to be able to consume this energy many times throughout evolution in the form of fruits and plants and you know, probably a little animal from, from hunt and foraging here and there, but really a lot of fruits, particularly in the late summer and early fall when the trees and the plants and the shrubs were fruiting. And we'd consume this energy and then we'd be able to store this energy as fat to tap into when food just wasn't readily available. Um, maybe that long winter that was coming up. So through evolution, when food was abundant, especially a high sugar food or a high fat food, our brains, this pathway would say, yes, keep eating. This is good. This is for survival. You're going to take whatever energy that you don't need right here and now, and you're going to store it as fat. So when that long winter comes, you're going to be good to go. Now, in nature, when you think of foods, there are no foods that have both a high fat and high sugar profile. They just don't exist. The closest thing is, you know, nuts, but nuts come with such a dense pack of fiber that it just doesn't get released and hit our system in any real impactful way. But when you look at the landscape of processed foods today, we have highly refined foods that are packed with added sugar, packed with fats combined and they hit your system in one brutal punch. And that is a major liability to our short and long-term health. So that's a little evolutionary, you know, background for this. Now let's, let's dive back into the research. Um, it's always important to hit on that because it helps make it clear what the hell is actually happening and why it's happening. So diving, back into the research. Just to recap where we are right now is mice fed the standard chow diet, giving 24 seven availability, stay pretty in sync with their natural rhythms. They don't get fat. They're overall, you know, rather healthy. However, mice fed a high sugar, high fat diet, having that being available 24 seven, they continue to eat and eat, disaligning from their natural circadian rhythms and becoming morbidly obese. So what's the next logical step here? You guessed it knock out the dopamine receptors in the brains of a group of mice that are fed a high sugar, high fat diet. And researchers did this. And in the study, they conveniently named these mice knockout mice. So what happened? Well, these knockout mice without the dopamine receptors, which were fed a high sugar, high fat diet, did normal mice things. Eating during the night, sleeping during the day, and not conducting all day, all night foraging and not becoming morbidly obese. Whoa, but let me tell you, researchers even took this a step further and rescued a subgroup of these mice that had these dopamine receptors knocked out, restoring the functionality of these dopamine receptors and this reward pathway. Guess what happened? Seriously, guess. What's your guess? Put it in the comments below. Pause the video, put the guess in the comments below. I'm gonna read it and then restart the video. Yep, you nailed it. They were right back to nonstop eating, foraging, and obesity. Ouch. Poor mice, poor humans, because this is what's happening. But that's a different story. We're talking only about mice here, not humans. Mice. Humans. This is what's happening. In the end, 
the researchers concluded that the availability of a 24 seven highly processed, high sugar, high fat diet and its effect on the mice's hedonic reward system disrupted and purely overpowered the organism's natural circadian rhythms, disrupting the mice's natural sleep wake cycles, setting up the organism for obesity and a high likelihood of disease down the line in mice. Can't forget that in mice. So the question becomes, how relevant is this to us? Um, I'm going to let you make that decision, but I suggest you think it through thoroughly. You see, we're not mice, but in the grand scheme of things, we're not too far from our cheese loving friends on the evolutionary tree. And with the human research that's available to date on how sugar affects our hedonic reward system, along with just the pure prevalence and abundance of disease, I'd think about it for a little bit and make decisions based off what you come up with. So I always like to conclude these videos with some practical tips. First off, to make this simple, I suggest you check out my eating for longevity video. You can see it here, up in the cards or down in the show notes below. We go through ways you can make eating for a long, healthy life simple. We go through the science, we go through how to implement it. We go through how to make it so you can live um, forever. Okay, so maybe like realistically to like 150 or 80, but still pretty good. Next, I suggest you take some time and educate yourself on how to read food labels. Understanding what you consume, what you put into your body, what the so-called foods you're eating are made up of is one of the best investments that you can make. You'll quickly see that a lot of the food that have a long shelf life that are in the middle aisles of your local grocery store is crap. It's not good for you. It's the opposite of good for you. Take some time. It's an investment worth making. A good next step is to analyze your current daily eating window and look at some ways to put some parameters around it. Time restricted feeding has scientifically shown to have a ton of benefits in humans not in mice, in humans. And it's something that you can implement rather easily once you have your benchmark, once you know where you're currently at, and then you could start to find ways to slowly but surely condense that without making major modifications to your diet or any modifications at all, just playing around with the timing. It has proved to be beneficial in human models, so it's definitely a step worth looking into. Again, we talk a lot about it on this channel. Show notes below, or you can even look at the Fasting 101 playlist we have. And lastly, this is really more of a foundational thing, but it really moves the needle in basically everything, and that is sleep. Start to implement some good sleep hygiene best practices. Good sleep will change your life. This is a space to invest in. Listen, before you get overwhelmed, all of this does not and probably shouldn't be implemented right here, right now. It's the small micro steps taking on a consistent basis that drive macro results. Remember that. So whatever small step you decide to take, I urge you do start today. The art of doing is a powerful, powerful practice. It compounds over time to things that you once couldn't even imagine you would do just by getting started. Where's it going to start for you? Don't end up like a furry friend.